Hey everyone, welcome to our lecture on chapter 19, Drifting Towards This Union. This is an incredibly important chapter, so hopefully you did the reading and hopefully this will reinforce what you read. So let's go ahead and get this started. One of the more important things to understand when looking at, you know, what kind of creates tensions that leads to the Civil War um, are some good books. Okay, Harriet Beecher Stowe writes the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, which I'm sure many of you guys have heard of, and it's mentioned briefly, I believe, in chapter 16. Uh, but Harriet Beecher Stowe is an incredibly amazing woman who writes this book uh, about a slave. And in this book, um, it talks about the slave auctions and families being broken up, and it's incredibly sad, um, and it very much humanizes um, the American slave. Okay, and, and why this book is so important is that it really shows the disgusting nature uh, of slavery. Okay, and this, I mean, this really kind of gets to people. Um, it really kind of gets to people's emotions. It convinces people kind of, a, of of the evils of slavery. It kind of opens their eyes in a sense to just how bad slavery is. Um, at the time of this recording of this lecture, my wife and I just went and saw 12 Years a Slave. Okay, uh, and that was very much a movie that kind of opened our eyes uh, to slavery. Not that we didn't know what slavery was before that, but just kind of like visualizing it and, and seeing this compelling story and hearing about this compelling story, you know, really kind of gets to you. And Uncle Tom's Cabin very much was that um, book that really kind of convinced people on, on the evils of slavery. Okay, it, it's incredibly inspirational. It's incredibly um, you know, thought-provoking, and it really gets to people both in this country and also in Europe. Um, in fact, many people suggest that this book was so influential that uh, the British and the French actually didn't intervene in the American Civil War because so many of their citizens had read the book and, uh, I guess, almost looked at the South as being almost villainous or evil um, because of these books, okay? Um, so anyways, a bunch of really important books. Harry Beecher's Uncle Tom's Cabin, incredibly important. Uh, in fact, Abraham Lincoln uh, was actually actually quoted as saying uh, when he met Harry Beecher Stowe, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, you're the little lady that got this war started. Um, so an incredibly influential book, okay? Um, moving on. So in, in the previous chapter, we, we get introduced to this Kansas-Nebraska Act that has passed, okay? Um, and the whole reason this Kansas-Nebraska Act has passed is because the Transcontinental Railroad opened up these territories for settlement, yada, yada, yada. But the effect of this act... Um, it, it is incredibly important for us to understand, okay? Um, when Kansas and Nebraska are opened up for settlement, okay, people obviously rush into it because it's cheap, sometimes free land, okay? Now, most of the people that go there are normal people that are just looking to start farms and kind of live their lives. However, the crazies from both sides um, rush into this territory as well because both sides know that this territory is now open to popular sovereignty, meaning that whoever has the most followers... Is going to win okay so if uh, the southerners want to see the expansion of slavery then they need to have their followers show up okay um and on voting day they need to vote so that these territories are open to slavery okay so you have these pro-slavery southerners rushing in uh you also have these abolitionists running in in fact a great example of these abolitionists running in there um are the new Im new england immigrant aid society and about 2,000 of these people uh, rush into these territories here, um, and they also bring with them their Beecher Bibles. And the Beecher Bibles are that is, is that gun you see on the top right of the slide there. Okay, and so basically you have uh, both sides send in hot-headed um, kind of crazies here um, that are basically going to lead to violence. Perhaps the most crazy of the two is John Brown, who is shown there in the picture in the lower right hand there. Uh, you're going to notice that as his life progresses, he's going to look even more and more crazy. So we're not done with John Brown just quite yet. Okay. So anyways, when the, when it is time for election, um, there is voter fraud all over the place. Okay. Um, it, it is an incredibly confusing what's going on. In fact, after the election, uh, two territorial governments are set up. There's a slave government that's set up in Shawnee Mission, and there's a free uh, government set up in Topeka. Okay, on top of this, we have violence erupting, okay, in Kansas. And I'm not talking like, you know, thousands upon thousands of people being slaughtered because there's not that many people there. Um, but there are, you know, there's bloodshed. Um, John Brown and his followers actually go and just randomly um, hack up people, like literally chopping off people's arms and stuff like that. 
um, you know, cities are being sacked, and it's just this mess, okay? So anyways, the Lecompton Constitution of Kansas has passed, and basically there's some kind of shenanigans that basically include slavery in the Constitution, okay? Um, meaning that Kansas will kind of be considered slave territory, all right? And so that's the effect uh, of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. We have violence uh, erupting throughout throughout these territories. In fact, it's often termed as bleeding Kansas. Okay. Um, here's a picture uh, or a political cartoon. Um, a political cartoon. Just I guess there's a painting of John Brown. You can see he's holding his Beecher his Beecher Bible in his in his right hand here. You can see he's holding um, which looks like scripture in his left hand. Um, you can see kind of the slave forces here and the freedom forces over here, okay? Um, but basically, this also leads to violence in the uh, in Congress. Um, here you can see a very famous political cartoon um, showing what appears to be, um, you know, one guy with a cane uh, beating a man senseless who is holding just a pen. And you can see people in the background kind of debating and kind of some creepy smiles and laughter, okay? And what this political cartoon is showing us here is basically Bully Brooks and his bludgeon. Um, and basically, here's what happens. Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts basically delivers his speech, and in his speech, he's basically, you know, condemning all these pro-slavery people that are in Kansas, and he's basically going after, you know, how they're being so shady and how they're not, you know, I guess following the rules of popular sovereignty. And he's insulting people, and he specifically insults one Andrew Butler, um, who's from South Carolina. And as we talked about before, South Carolina, these guys are nuts. All right? South Carolina, they're full of all these fire eaters. They are just, they are hot-headed people here. Okay? And so anyways, uh, Congress named Preston Brooks basically decides to defend the honor of South Carolina and Andrew Butler, and he basically just walks in um, to the Senate chambers, and he starts beating Charles Sumner with his cane, and he beats him so hard um, that the dude's cane actually breaks in half, okay? And Sumner's seriously injured. Like, Sumner has to go to Europe for medical treatment. He's gone for quite a while. Uh, it's, it's a serious injury, okay? Um, so Brooks, like, resigns because, obviously, he just, like, consider, you know, committed assault in the, in, in the chambers of the Senate. Um, but he's re-elected um, by, by the people in South Carolina, and his campaign slogan is, use knockdown arguments, which is... I guess maybe it's 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 kind of funny, I guess, um, in, in, in a sort of a sad way. Um, that basically, this guy's reelected after assaulting one of his colleagues, and people actually send this guy new canes uh, to go and beat you know some more northerners here. So not only is there violence erupting in Kansas uh, over the expansion of slavery, but there's also violence erupting within um, the chambers of Congress um, between northerners and southerners here. So you can kind of see that tension is rising. And it's all because of this Kansas-Nebraska issue that's going on, okay? Anyways, the election of 1856 pops up. And I think we've mentioned this a little bit before, maybe in the last chapter. But the election of 1856 is significant because the Republicans are basically here. They've arrived. Um, this is their first real national uh, election uh, for the presidency. We talked about in the last election, 1852, uh, the Whig Party has, has, has essentially died. And the Republican Party's... Uh, Republican Party is kind of the replacement of the Whigs, all right? So Democrats nominate James Buchanan, who historians have typically rated as one of our worst presidents uh, in history. The w main reason he's nominated is because he's not involved in any way with Kansas-Nebraska. So that, that, that's a plus. The Republicans take a little bit out of the, um, I guess, copy the Whigs a little bit, and they nominate, quote-unquote, war hero John Fremont of the Mexican-American War, Okay. Um, so Republicans are very much a regional, uh, sectional party, okay? Uh, their support is only in the North. They're pretty much anti-slavery, uh, and that is anti the expansion of slavery, that is. Not that they're abolitionists in any manner, um, but they are against the expansion of slavery, okay? And then also you have the crazy Know Nothing Party, who are basically just people that hate immigrants, okay? And they nominate uh, good old Millard Fillmore, a former obscure president, Okay. So what happens in the election of 1856? Okay, the South basically threatens to secede if they say, quote-unquote, a black Republican was elected. Basically saying black Republican because Republicans were seen as supporters of um, abolishing slavery or stopping the expansion of slavery. Okay, and this freaks a lot of people out. In fact, many people vote against the Republicans just because they don't want to see the South leave the Union. They don't want to see 
um, you know, disunion in any manner. Okay, it is significant for a couple of reasons. Number one, the Republicans do win um, a, a good chunk of states here. So for a for a first time party in an election, Republicans are surprisingly strong, and that's going to threaten the South because the South basically sees once again the Republicans as being just a northern party um, that basically is not even trying to hide. Um, I guess the fact that the Republicans don't really have any respect for the South. Okay, so the, so that's something the South is obviously very concerned with. So Buchanan's elected. He's an incredibly incompetent president. He doesn't do anything. Once the session does happen under his um, presidency, he doesn't do anything to stop it. And so before Lincoln even becomes president, secession has already happened. And so Buchanan, like I said, he is that very much that incompetent president. Okay. Further inflaming the issue is the Dred Scott decision. Okay, so Dred Scott is a slave. Okay, and his master takes him into what is now Illinois and Wisconsin territory for about five years. Okay, now because Dred Scott is living on what is called free soil, meaning that slavery cannot exist there, he basically sues for his freedom. Okay, saying that look, hey, um, I should be free here. Um, I cannot be a slave on this territory. Thus, I'm a free man. And so his case is brought before the Supreme Court. And the decision that the Supreme Court made uh, at this time was incredibly inflammatory, okay, and had drastic effects on um, the course of this nation. Now, the majority of the court, once again, we talked a little bit about this in the last chapter, the majority of the court uh, are, are, are Southerners, okay? And so you can probably kind of see where this is going. The Supreme Court ruled that Scott was a slave and not a citizen. And because he wasn't a citizen, he couldn't sue in federal courts because he had no legal standing. Okay. Furthermore, the court also went ahead and said that Scott was essentially private property. And because private property is guaranteed in the Constitution, okay, and these founding principles of America, um, the federal government had no right to tell people where they could or couldn't take their property. So with that further opinion, that actually basically debunks um, the Missouri Compromise of 1820 and essentially makes it unconstitutional and null and void. Now, the effects of this are going to be drastic because this is going to just make the Northerners, and especially the Republicans, incredibly irate. It's obviously going to please the Southerners, but it's going to anger those Northerners. Okay, And probably more importantly, this issue alone is going to split the Democratic Party. Okay. Uh, the northern Northern Democrats are going to be very displeased with this decision, while the Southern Democrats are going to be very pleased with it. And because of this decision, it's going to put a wedge in the Democratic Party, and it's essentially going to destroy the Democrats. And we're going to see in the very next election, the election of 1860, we're going to see there's going to be Northern Democratic Party and there's going to be a Southern Democratic Party. And because the Democrats are going to split their power, it's basically going to ensure someone else is going to be able to walk in and grab the presidency. And obviously, I think we can all kind of see the writing on the wall here. That's going to be the Republicans, namely Abraham Lincoln. So anyway, speaking of Lincoln, Lincoln kind of bursts on the scene in the Mexican-American War with the spot resolutions, and he continues to kind of pop up um, throughout the next decade or so. He runs for Senate in 1856 against Stephen Douglas, a very well-known Illinois politician. Okay, And basically, Lincoln debates Douglas um, seven times, and they're basically talking about slavery. Okay, Now, Lincoln is unsuccessful in, in defeating Douglas for the Senate seat. I guess the thing we can take away from these debates that Lincoln and Douglas have is that by debating with Lincoln, Douglas does win the Senate, as I just said, but he also kind of alienates himself from Southern Democrats, okay? Um, you know, the Lecompton Constitution, he's opposed to, which basically installs slavery in Kansas. So he is opposed to that, okay? And that's going to make him, I guess, very unpopular with many of these Southerners, uh, these Southern Democrats. And so essentially, this puts another wedge, these Lincoln-Douglas debates, um, this just makes, makes Douglas much more unpopular among Southern Democrats, which is further going to open the door for Lincoln uh, in the election of 1860. On top of all that, I feel like we're just adding on top of here, um, more, more on top of more here, um, but John Brown, the crazy from the beginning of the presentation here, um, he, he resurfaces. 
okay? And this guy, John Brown, has this scheme, okay, where he's going to basically uh, start a slave rebellion, okay, in, in these southern slave states. And the way he's going to do that is he feels that if he goes and captures a federal armory, armory, which is where, you know, the federal government keeps a lot of their weapons and rifles and cannons, what have you, he's going to take some of these rifles and, and weapons and what have you, and he's going to go ahead and he's going to go to plantation to plantation, and he's going to start arming slaves. And they're basically just going to keep on moving down throughout the South, arming slaves, and basically inciting this rebellion. That's his plan. However, he's captured, tried, and hanged. So his plan never really gets off the ground running. He does take over the armory, but for whatever reason, he takes over the armory and he stays there for a couple days. He never leaves. And so, you know, time is given for the Virginia militia to show up and they capture him. And in fact, kind of an interesting side note here. Uh, Robert E. Lee, the famous Confederate general, is the one who captures him. So anyways, um, so Harper's Ferry uh, very much alienates the South. Okay, um, Here we see a northerner, a northern abolitionist, um, who the North considers a hero, um, basically tries to incite insurrection um, of the Southerners, to, in to incite this rebellion of slaves to rise up against their masters, to murder their masters and their families, and the South is like, whoa, 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 this is crazy. Okay, so once again, what is this doing? This is creating a wedge between North and South. We see just, once again, this is just kind of piling up here. Okay, um, and once again, it depends on where you are in the country. In the North, he's considered a martyr. In the South, he's considered a murderer. Okay, so once again, John Brown creates more of a wedge. Uh, even though he is executed by the federal government, um, this violent attack on Southern interest is something that the South is very much going to uh, take offense to and feel threatened by. So anyways, I, I kind of mentioned this, these the, these things that are creating this divide among the Democrats. And sure enough, by the time the election of 1860 does roll around, we see the Democratic Party is split. Okay, You see Stephen Douglas, he's the Northern Democratic candidate. You have John Breckinridge, he's the Southern Democratic candidate. And then you have John Bell, who is kind of the middle of the road, let's all be friends, let's not break up, you know, Democrat. Okay, and his party is called the Constitutional Union Party. Okay, and there you can see basically what all three of these guys stand for. But basically, the Democrats have split into regional areas. You have your Northern Democrat, you have your Deep South Democrat, and then you have kind of like in the middle Democrat. And I suppose I probably should have put John Bell in the middle, but anyways, I didn't. So, whatever. So, anyways, all three of these guys are going to run against Abraham Lincoln. All right, so Lincoln, what's his platform? He's a Republican, right? So he's a Republican. Republicans believe in the following things. They don't want to see the extension of slavery. They want to have protective tariffs. They want a Pacific Railroad through the North. They want internal improvements at the federal expense. Okay? And they want free farms um, throughout, you know, all this new Louisiana territory here. Okay? It is important to note that even though the Republicans are against the expansion or the extension of slavery, they are not abolitionists. They are not campaigning. I can't say this enough. They are not campaigning for the abolition of slavery. They are not suggesting that, um, you know, the South get rid of their slaves or free their slaves. They're just saying we don't want to see slavery expand. It needs to stay where it is. Now, to be fair, many Republicans and Northerners felt that if slavery was, I guess, confined to where it was, it would eventually die out. Okay? And that's why many Southerners wanted to expand slavery because they kind of felt that way too. All right. So anyways, the election of 1860 happens, okay? And we've already looked at this map before, but here it is again. If you take a closer look, um, you can see it's very much a sectional race, okay? Um, you can see that Lincoln wins the North and pretty much all the free states, including Oregon and California to the West. Uh, you see Breckenridge, a Southern Democrat, takes most of the, I guess, the Deep South, okay? And you see... Um, Bell, the Constitutional Union Democrats, the he takes, I guess, kind of the, the border states, you know, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, um, those states. All right. Now, here's a, by the way, a picture of it. Lincoln um, giving his uh, inaugural speech, by the way, and you can see the Capitol building still being constructed. So Lincoln wins the election, but here's the important thing. All right. Lincoln wins the election, but he's minority president. Okay, meaning that 60% of the voters voted for someone else. Okay, in fact, if you were to add up all the northern and southern Democrats, 
they would have got the most votes. Let's go back to that map there. Okay, so here we see um, Breckenridge here, 1.3 million votes. Okay, and then you have Douglas, the Northern Democrat, 847,000 votes. And so had the Democrats voted together, they most likely probably would have won. Okay, because once again, all these Northern Democrats up here, um, you know, they're they're split, and so there's a lot of law support in the North um, because of the Democrats being split. All right, so that that's obviously a very important issue is the fact that all these Democrats are split. Once again, also considering that right here, uh, most of these people that vote for Bell were also Democrats as well. Okay, so Democrats overwhelmingly would have defeated Lincoln, which kind of is an interesting what if history kind of thing. So anyways, uh, Lincoln wins, okay, and he's clearly a sectional president, okay, he's simply a northern candidate. In fact, Lincoln doesn't even show up on the ballot in 10 of the southern states, okay. Now, the South had already said in 1856 that if a Republican won the presidency, they're out. And so, with the election of Lincoln, it's kind of the last nail in the coffin as far as, um, you know, the country kind of holding together. And so the South's going to leave. But once again, even though the South is going to leave, let's once again look at the fact that the South really isn't that bad, isn't, isn't really that bad off. They still have a majority in the Supreme Court. The Republicans still don't control either House of Congress, the Democrats do. And the federal government couldn't touch slavery in the states because to do that, they would need a constitutional amendment that could be defeated by one-fourth of the states. And the South had nearly half the states. And so the institution of slavery is not threatened here. Okay, what is threatened though is uh, the South feels that their rights aren't being respected, that they're part of a government that is hostile towards them, and they don't feel like they belong anymore. Okay, and so they're going to basically say peace out and they're going to take off. Okay, and once again, why are they leaving? Okay, and this is where we get into the very complicated thing about like, you know, what was the cause of slavery or the cause of the Civil War? Excuse me, everyone's like, it's slavery. It is and it isn't. Okay, clearly slavery was a point of contention. Okay, um, the South fought the Civil War to protect slavery. The North fought the Civil War to keep the country together. And throughout the war, eventually that changes when the North does seem to then kind of shift gears and also fight to end slavery. Okay, but at first it's not about that. So anyways, why does the South leave? Political balance. They've lost it. Okay, the Republican Party is basically threatening their rights. Okay, on top of that, you have abolitionists, you have Northern Interference, you got John Brown, you got the non-enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Law, you have all these things kind of just piling on top of each other, and it's basically just, once again, angering the Southerners. Okay, so anyways, eventually, many of the Southern states do leave. Okay, um, and why do they leave? Okay, they leave because, once again, they don't feel like the people in the North want to fight. Okay, they also don't believe that northern manufacturers who are dependent on southern cotton are going to basically hurt themselves economically by fighting the South. All right, um, there's also a strong sense of nationalism developing the South, kind of this southern character. Okay, uh, and once again, as weird as it sounds, this almost looks just like the Declaration of Independence here, where you have, you know, the 13 colonies leaving the British because their rights aren't being recognized. The southern states felt the same way. It was almost like a second war of independence here. Okay. So anyways, secession happens. Wouldn't you know it, South Carolina is the first state to go. All right. And when South Carolina goes, the deep south follows them. So the cotton south follows them. So you can see the states in the blue. They leave before Fort Sumner. Now, here's the important thing, guys. The gray states, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas, these states are kind of wishy-washy. There's some pretty intense debate about whether or not um, these these states should secede and join those deep join those those deep south states. Okay, the only reason those states do secede and join the Confederacy is when violence erupts. So Fort Sumner is fired upon, and Lincoln orders um, basically troops to be called up to go into those southern states and suppress the rebellion. When that happens, these states in the gray, they decide to join the Confederacy. Now, it's important to note that there are slave states that never join the Confederacy. Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware. These are states where slavery is legal, and there are slaves in these states. 
These states stay with the Union and fight on the Union side, even though they themselves have slaves. And that's an important thing for us to remember. Okay. So anyways, that's kind of chapter 19 in a nutshell here. So we're going to stop there for today. Uh, feel free to tweet me or email me any questions.